Company and His Excellency Hamid Karzai, President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our distinguished guests from all around the world, especially Afghanistan, our faculty, our students, colleagues, and friends. The U.S. Afghan Women's Council at Georgetown University is so delighted to co-host tonight's event. This very dynamic council is a public-private partnership with members from a broad array of sectors who seek to advance the role of women and children in Afghan society. And they have invested heavily in the society, in health, education, entrepreneurship, and political leadership. Our president, John DeJoya, is one of the co-chairs of the council. And it is my great pleasure to introduce him this evening. He is a scholar, an advocate, and a true friend of Afghanistan. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McGrab, for that introduction and for your work as vice chair of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. I wish to also thank the members of the delegation from Afghanistan, the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, the Diplomatic Corps, and all of our distinguished guests from around the world for joining us this evening. We're also deeply appreciative of the U.S. State Department and the Embassy of Afghanistan for helping to convene tonight's event. It's a privilege to welcome back to Georgetown His Excellency, the President of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai. We look forward to hearing his remarks on Afghanistan beyond 2014, a perspective on Afghan-U.S. relations. 2014 will be an historic year for Afghanistan as it will witness elections across the country and the end of U.S. and ISAF combat operations. As President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton, and many in this room have emphasized this transition provides us with the opportunity for a new era of diplomatic, commercial, and cultural relations between our peoples. At Georgetown, we are proud to be a part of this critical work, notably through the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. The Council is a public-private partnership that has been housed here at the University since 2008. It was founded in 2002 by President Karzai and President George W. Bush to mobilize both public and private sector resources in support of Afghan women and children. It has focused its work in the areas of education, health, economic empowerment, leadership development, and humanitarian assistance. Since its founding, the Council has created scholarships for students, constructed a learning center for disadvantaged children, helped to build the capacity of women-led NGOs, provided skills training, literacy, and healthcare, trained healthcare workers and midwives, established a burn center to treat victims and provide reconstructive surgery, and provided leadership training for Afghan women. In recent years, we have also witnessed significant improvements in the lives of women and children throughout Afghanistan. Educational opportunities for all children, including girls, have increased. Improvements have been made in the area of maternal and child health, with the maternal mortality rate having dropped from 1,000 deaths per 100,000 births in the year 2000 to 460 today. Tremendous advancements in the information, communication, and technology sector have been realized, with 90% of Afghanistan now covered by the four main telecom providers. We wish to ensure that these successes are sustained, built upon, and expanded into the future, and we recognize that much more must be done. 
and we look forward to working together with our partners in both the public and private sectors to continue to see improvements in the lives of Afghan women and children and the Afghan people as a whole. As co-chair of the council, I also wish to invite each of you in this room to become involved in our common work. Tonight here in Gaston Hall, this work continues. We have the opportunity to hear from the leader of Afghanistan, to hear his thoughts on the future of his country, his people, and Afghan-US relations. As a university and the Catholic and Jesuit tradition, we believe in the power of discourse and dialogue to bring us to a greater understanding of one another, of our shared world, and our work together. And we look forward to the dialogue that tonight's program will inspire in the weeks and in the months ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my privilege to welcome to the podium His Excellency, the President of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai. Please, thank you very much. Please, please, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim President Dijoya, Dr. McGrath, this is my second time in this lovely hall. The first time was quite a few years ago and when I was very popular in the U.S. <laughs> the second time is more real time. And this university is also the one that has honored me with an honorary doctorate. And I thank you once again, President DeJoya, for that. It's hanging in my living room with the expectation that my son one day will be studying here. So I keep telling him, Georgetown University. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, a journey that we began together in 2001, that is Afghanistan and the United States. was for a great cause. Freeing the world from terrorism and radicalism, liberating Afghanistan from a creeping invasion and that tyrannical obscurantist rule by the Taliban. The first one, in reverse order, the first one, freeing Afghanistan, happened within a month and a half to two months. And subsequent to that, Afghanistan began its journey towards democracy, the rule of law, progress in all aspects of life as all societies desire, it went all right. It went reasonably good under the circumstances. And without a doubt, with the help of the United States and our other allies around the world. The second part, freeing us all from terrorism and radicalism, didn't work as smoothly as we expected. There were serious bumps along the road and setbacks. Now, the Afghan people, regardless of where they stand ideologically on all these issues, recognize that Afghanistan could not have made the progress that we have made in the past 10 years without the help that we received from our allies. 
led by the United States of America. In more closer terms, the US taxpayers' money. <laughs> it did contribute massively to Afghanistan's upliftment. The return of women to the workplace, to society, to polity, the return of young girls to education, and boys, of course, the return of universities, roads, communications, mobile phones, computers, <laughs> all of that. Mobile phone wasn't a joke. <laughs> I meant it. When we started in 2001, we barely had telephones. My office was given a few uh, uh, walkie-talkies by the United Nations in orange color. That was the means of communication we had. Today, Afghanistan's population of nearly 30 million has telephone available to 18 million of it. Not one or two or three uh, companies, but many more, four or five, and they own them all. So the country has made progress. Now, the war on terror has been costly. It has been costly to you in America. So many of your men and women in uniform and civilians have lost life. It has been costly to our other allies. It has also been costly, massively, massively to the Afghan people. We have lost, in the past 10 years, tens of thousands of our civilians to violence. This year alone, I mean, last year, this year has just begun. Each month we lose, we lost 250 of our servicemen and women to terrorism and nearly 450 casualties in our civilians each month. So the cost has been immense. Therefore, complaints on both sides. It's been a difficult journey, a journey in which at times expectations are not met, and when that doesn't happen, both sides complain. I'm aware of the complaint in your media. You are aware of my complaints. But the journey continued. The relationship continued out of a reality that Afghanistan would always be better off in close contact and partnership with the United States. And that is why. Last year, when we convened the Afghan lawyer Jirga, or the Grand Council of the Afghan people, what you call caucus in the United States, the Afghan people voted overwhelmingly for partnership with the United States. But the Afghan people voted overwhelmingly for partnership in the United States as a sovereign country, and expecting that that sovereignty would be respected by our allies. Today. I'm glad to report to you, ladies and gentlemen, that us, the Afghans, and the United States government agreed on a format for expanding our relationship into the bilateral security agreement by which the United States will reduce its forces in Afghanistan, will stay beyond 2014 in a limited number uh, in certain facilities in Afghanistan, and that the United States will continue to train and equip and assist Afghanistan, 
and that Afghanistan will be responsible for its own security, protection of its own borders, and all that comes with it. So, is the future certainly good for us? Does it have dangers on its way? Are we certain to move forward? Will this partnership work? Yes. What you hear in segments of the analytical world, the NGOs, or the uh, various bodies uh, informing you on events in Afghanistan, the media, if I watched television in the United States or in Europe, and then if I judged Afghanistan from that perspective, it will be a disaster. I would lose all hope. But if I came from Afghanistan, with all the traffic jams there, with all the pollution there now, with all the phones ringing there, with all the uh, television channels there, with all the media there, with all the hustle and bustle of life, and the young people going to education and studying and working and, and making life move forward, the wheel go forward, I would give you a different perspective. I would say Afghanistan is definitely moving in the right direction. 2014 will be a good year for us, and the years after will be even better, and that this country will have its third presidential elections. In a year and a few months from today, I'll be a retired president. There will be a new president elected by the Afghan people. The economy will move further. It has already been growing at 8 to 9 percent annually in the past 10 years, from a mere $180 of uh, income per capita. Today we are speaking of nearly six to $700. From a mere, I don't know, 200 millions of uh, our reserves. Today we are talking of, uh, I don't know if I should tell you that because the US government will hear me and <laughs> not help us anymore. $7 billion in our reserves, uh, more than 30 universities, private and public, roads, electricity, the future holds clear in progress and prosperity by the standards of our region and Afghanistan. Now, Will Afghanistan, 10 years from now, be a very prosperous country? Will Afghanistan, 10 years from now, have resolved all its difficulties? Will Afghanistan be a superpower? No. But Afghanistan will be a country that will be moving forward. Education will grow better. Thousands of our students will graduate in our own universities. Thousands more will come from studies abroad, who are now studying abroad. The democracy and the institutions that democracy requires will grow further. There will be more elections. There will be more parliamentarians coming. There will be more uh, uh, institutional reform. There will be a better civil service. There will be a better governance. But Afghanistan will continue to face problems. There may be violence. There may be other um, uh, uh, impediments on the way forward, but this wheel of progress will move in continuity and not stop. Will Afghanistan remember the United States as a country that helped or a country did not help? Definitely Afghanistan will remember the United States as a country that helped. Definitely, Afghanistan will remember that it was the U.S. assistance that brought so much good to Afghanistan. 
we will forget the less pleasant aspects of our relationship. We will move forward in the uh, gratitude of the help that the United States has provided to Afghanistan and also our other neighbors. But from today onwards, as we move forward, will this relationship be emotional as it was at times, and you've heard us all in the past many years? Will this relationship be emotional or will this relationship be more mature? This relationship has already grown mature. We recognize the United States interest in Afghanistan and the region, and the United States recognizes that Afghanistan is a good old entity there and has a life of its own, has a law of its own, has a social context of its own. And within that social context, Afghanistan will move forward in partnership with America and also in partnership with the uh, other countries of NATO that have uh, helped us in the past many years. Will Afghanistan beyond 2014 be a country that you can visit as tourists? Yes, it will be. Will Afghanistan suffer the consequences of terrorism? It might on occasions. Will the peace process work? Yes, it will. Will the peace process take us back to times where the Afghan women could not go to work? No. Will we keep our progress and the achievements of the past 10 years in spite of the peace process, in spite of the return of Taliban to the Afghan social and political life? Yes. And this assurance is important today to give through this forum where the Afghan Women Council was created many years ago, that Afghanistan will have peace, but that peace with the Taliban will not drive us away from the gains that we have made. Rather, those gains will definitely be consolidated and those gains will remain with the Afghan people. Today, as I'm talking to you, Afghanistan has a standing army and police of 350,000 people. Afghanistan has a banking sector. Afghanistan has a strong agriculture. You've all heard of pomegranates. They come from Afghanistan. <laughs> You've all heard of grapes. They come from Afghanistan, the ones that come from Afghanistan. I know you have them in California as well. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, there is a country in Afghanistan, just like here in America, just like in the rest of the world. There are weddings and wedding halls. There is music. There is um, cars honking. There are, uh, there are buses. There are donkey-driven cars. There, are, there is life. There is society. This society is as lively and moving forward as any other society. And it is this that I would like you to remember when you think of Afghanistan, a country of 5,000 years history, at least, a country that has produced thinkers, philosophers, poets, a country that has had a good past, a country like all other countries has also suffered in its history. And I can tell you, that the most recent period of the suffering of the Afghan history is behind us. A new period is beginning, has already begun, and that new period will be consolidated with 2014 coming, where your sons and daughters will no longer be burdened protecting Afghanistan, where the Afghan sons and daughters will take the mantle and will move forward. We will have plenty more to do. And that plenty more can best be described by frost. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep, 
and miles to go before we sleep in Afghanistan. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And we did this on Facebook, mm -hmm. so we could get as broad a response as possible. Mm -hmm. And I have the daunting job of choosing, synthesizing, and trying to frame this question. Mm -hmm. So you know students are very frank. And in their responses, the students at Georgetown, including several of our Afghan students, expressed their concerns about corruption, security, mm -hmm. women's rights, and economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. So the first question I would like to put to you on behalf of all these students is, what hope can you offer the young generation of Afghan men and women? Great question. Thank you. Great question, ma'am. <laughs> The hope has already been offered in Afghanistan. When we had in 2001 only a few thousand students going to schools and none of them girls, where today you have eight million students going to school, 45% of them girls, that hope is already there and taken and used well. When you have out of a membership of 240 in the Afghan parliament, 70 of them women, that is already taken. When you have the country having built uh, thousands of kilometers of roads, never in the past did we build so many roads in 10 years that opportunity is taken. Where the country today has students, politicians, businesses moving forward and thriving, that hope is taken. The question should be, ma'am, Will this hope persist and continue after 2014, when the international forces will withdraw from Afghanistan, when the Afghans, please, ma'am, <laughs> when, 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 the, when the Afghans will be on their own, will we continue with this hope? Definitely, without a doubt. And if I am lucky enough to stand before you here again, 10 years on, you will see that I can speak three times in numbers as I'm speaking today to you for the achievements that we have. So that certainty is there, ma'am, and I am absolutely sure it is going to be the case. Thank you very much. That's Thank very you. hopeful. And now we, um, in order to get a broader representation of questions, we've asked four of our student organizations to formulate a question for His Excellency. And the first organization that I'd like to call to the mic is the International Development Club. And please introduce yourself. Um, good evening, Mr. President, and thank you for being with us here tonight. Uh, my name is Emily Siegler, and I'm chair of the International Relations Club. Close enough. Um, <laughs> My question to you tonight on behalf of my organization is this. From a security perspective, because of US military developments in Afghanistan, one of the greatest concerns is that Al Qaeda will rebound and that Afghanistan will once again become a terrorist safe haven. Mm -hmm. How can the government mitigate this possibility without risking an increase in green on blue attacks? Thank you, ma'am. One of the reasons the, the United States will uh, continue a limited presence in Afghanistan after 2014 uh, in certain facilities in Afghanistan uh, uh, is because we have decided together 
to continue to fight against Al-Qaeda. So there will be no respite in that. Rather, we will continue to uh, work against them, and they will not definitely uh, return to Afghanistan. Uh, they are decimated largely, and on their way out. Um, what, daily when I work in Afghanistan, uh, when I receive security reports from the ministries and when we have our Sunday meetings on security issues, we never come across a question on Al-Qaeda, whether it's there as a threat. No. So I can assure you of, 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 of um, uh, the fact that uh, the fight against Al-Qaeda will continue and affiliates to Al-Qaeda will continue. And part of the reason that the United States will, con will continue to have its uh, facilities in Afghanistan with the presence of certain uh, troops there will be to continue that task. It is also recognized by our neighbors and understood. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. <clears throat> My name is Thomas Gibbons Neff. I am the president of the Student Veterans Association here on campus. And I've served two deployments to your country as a United States Marine. My question to you is this, Mr. President. <clears throat> what would you say to an American family that has lost a son or daughter in Afghanistan, and what would you say they died for? Well, that's a very relevant question. The United States came to Afghanistan as I began in my remarks to defeat terrorism and Al-Qaeda after the September 11 attacks. Uh, the United States came to Afghanistan for the security of the United States and, by extension, the rest of the world. And also, for Afghans, that act of fighting Al-Qaeda and terrorists in Afghanistan brought the liberation of Afghanistan from those forces. Those unfortunate uh, incidents of the lives lost in Afghanistan were for the safety and security of the United States, of the American people, and also, by extension, of the rest of us in the international community, just like the sacrifices of the Afghan people. And that's how we should look at it. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Tucker Shalvin. I'm a member of the lecture fund here at Georgetown and a sophomore as well. In yesterday's New York Times, a story ran detailing how Taliban fighters who have laid down their arms are growing increasingly frustrated and they're returning to their villages in the Taliban. Uh, in the article, many of them cited a high, a high unemployment rate as the reason for their frustration. What steps are you and the High Peace Council going to be taking to provide jobs for these former fighters and to combat this trend? Well, I'm glad to know this. Uh, uh, the High Peace Council whose chairman is here with us and whose secretary general is here with us, have a fund uh, that is dedicated for this purpose. And uh, this program is called the Reintegration Program, where the Taliban lay down arms and uh, join back uh, uh, with the society. Uh, there is a program of uh, reconstruction activity and of uh, employment uh, uh, in the, in the country, if there are instances, and I'm sure there are instances of this, where some Taliban are uh, not given the required assistance uh, sooner, uh, that's something that we will definitely look at, and, and I'm sure uh, we'll also have a look at the New York Times' article. I haven't gone through it so far, but that's a very important question, and thank you for reminding us. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Nursultan Eldasov. I'm a third year student in the School of Foreign Service and I'm with the Muslim Student Association. My question is focused on education. Um, we understand that education is a vital factor in the overall growth and future stability of Afghanistan. Educated citizens can drive change from within and most importantly, redefine the country's narrative. What are your plans, both short term and long term, to ensure that this wheel of progress that you mentioned of education continues to move, move forward? especially with regards to increased access and education for women. Thank you. Afghanistan did see uh, uh, a great deal of violence against uh, schools and girls going to schools uh, in the initial years uh, by the Taliban. 
fortunately, we succeeded against that. Uh, there are uh, fewer of uh, such violent incidents against uh, educational institutions and uh, girls. And fortunately, Pakistan is going through a very difficult time in this regard. Uh, the attack on Malala Yousafzai in Pakistan and, and, and other events there uh, are, a, are a source of concern for us. Uh, I can speak with satisfaction, though with the suffering that we've had in this regard, that um, uh, our schools uh, are safer in the past uh, three years, that uh, the, the a great majority of, of girls who go to school in Afghanistan do it in safety and, and security. We have not had any major incidents um, uh, in the past year, and indeed uh, before that. And as we move forward, uh, uh, this concern for families and students will be less and less a matter to think of. Thank you, sir.